This is the red heartbeat of Christmas Island. Its red crabs are one of the most spectacular biological wonders of the world. Each year, for countless thousands of years, they have mass migrated in their tens of millions from the forests down to the shore to spawn. But the red crabs and their unique island ecosystem are now under threat from a small but lethal enemy, the yellow crazy ant. Christmas Island is in crisis. It is facing a threat as alarming as any in its turbulent past. Born of an ancient volcano, then uplifted and immersed many times, Christmas Island now survives as a rugged, isolated island in the Indian Ocean far to the west of Australia. Over millennia, this isolated island grew into a haven and breeding place for sea creatures and sea birds. Christmas Island's marine origins and millions of years of occupation by birds worked its magic to create soils rich in calcium phosphate, the ideal nursery for the growth of a lavish rainforest. It was also the perfect setting for a remarkable invasion from the sea. This forest became a paradise for several species of land crabs. Blue crabs retain the strongest links to their marine past. They have fully developed gills and carry reservoirs of water under their shells. Alongside them live crabs so perfectly adapted to life on land that they can no longer survive in water. Robber crabs are powerful enough to tear open fresh coconuts with their claws. They have legs as long as a child's arm and are the most colossal land crabs on earth. But big as they are, robber crabs do not dominate the forest floor on Christmas Island. That distinction belongs to red crabs. Red crabs dominate through sheer numbers. There are between 80 and 120 million of them living on this small island and their burrows are everywhere. As they dig their burrows in their slow, methodical way, they cultivate the forest floor, tilling the soil, aerating and replenishing it. These small ecosystem engineers also recycle and remove debris. They eat leaf litter, seeds and seedlings, excreting it as nutrient-rich deposits. The whole of the rainforest's well-being rests in the claws of these small but consummate gardens. But once a year, a powerful call draws them back to the ocean that they once emerged from. That call comes with the first of the monsoon rains. Frigate birds nesting close to the clifftops are the first to feel the cooling drops. As the rain reaches the forest floor, it triggers a flurry of activity among the red crabs. They start to move, slowly, in small numbers at first. But within a few hours, the movement has spread around the island and the annual migration back to the ocean is underway. It will be a journey fraught with danger. As the crabs move coastward, the rain stops. But there's no turning back. They continue on, risking dehydration beneath the hot, tropical sun. In an effort to conserve water, they journey in the early morning or late evening, moving from shade to shade if they can.
But there's one place that offers no shade, only danger. Roads crisscross the island, and most migrants must cross at least one. Red crabs are cannibals and eat fallen companions. For these gardeners are also meat eaters and will dispose of any carrion in the forest. But beyond the road, they face a far more serious and sinister threat. Crazy ants. The ants attack, finding chinks in the crab's seemingly impenetrable armor. They have no defense against the ferocity of the onslaught. Ants target the crab's vulnerable points, the eyes and the mouth. They swing their abdomens forward, spraying deadly jets of formic acid. The acid attracts still more ants. Escape is impossible. In an effort to flush out the burning acid, the crabs force moisture through their gill openings. It creates a mass of froth, but it's a futile attempt at self-preservation. It only dehydrates and distresses them, and they slowly die. Crazy ants killed an estimated three million red crabs in one year, and now scientists are investigating how to stop the ants. The task for Dennis O'Dowd and Peter Green is daunting. Crazy ant colonies are spreading at the rate of up to three meters a day around the island. The tiny invaders seem unstoppable. The crabs have been dying here for a while. This one a bit pale and it's starting to break up. And to add, on, add insult to injury, you quite often find ant nests inside the old carcasses. Whatever plan the scientists recommend, the job of putting it into action will go to Parks Australia. Park manager Max Orchard and his team are responsible for the maintenance of the national park that covers two thirds of Christmas Island. Tree falls are relatively common and any that block roads or tracks are cleared away immediately. This large trunk will be difficult to move, so they decide to split it lengthways first. But in doing so, they make a startling and chilling discovery. Within a hairline crack of this healthy trunk is a large nest of yellow crazy ants. The worker ants rush to rescue the exposed larvae and bundles of egg masses. A single colony may have hundreds of queens within it. What makes crazy ants such formidable enemies is that each queen has the potential to start a new colony anytime, anywhere. But most alarming of all is that unlike many other ants, crazy ants aren't territorial. They cooperate with each other. What appear to be separate colonies is in reality a huge super colony that acts and works as one vast, slowly expanding army of devastation. To better understand the crazy ant offensive, scientists are trying to track the spread of the colonies. 
but parts of the rainforest are almost impenetrable, and tracking them will be exceedingly difficult. Global positioning system by satellite, or GPS, is one technique being trialled. But there's a problem. Even in the less dense areas, signals can't penetrate the forest canopy. Another solution must be found if the crabs and rainforest are to be saved. Some crabs have made it to the coast. Their reduced numbers show the huge toll the crazy ants are taking. There's usually millions of crabs here. They come to dip and soak in the sea. Some merely paddle, absorbing seawater through hair patches at the base of their legs. Others use their claws to spoon water. The water replaces moisture and salts lost during their year in the forest. The intense heat and lack of monsoon rains has left many crabs dehydrated. At Waterfall Cove, the frigate birds too are feeling the heat. They pant and fan their wings in an effort to stay cool. Fresh water from the spring floats on top of more dense seawater and the frigate birds skim the surface to drink. Within a few days, most of the surviving crabs have reached the outcrops, cliffs and beaches of Christmas Island. Places like Greta Beach are the most dangerous for crabs to dip. There's little to hold on to, and they risk being swept out to sea where they will drown. Max Orchard and his crew monitor the number of crabs that have made it to the shoreline. In previous years, it's been one of the uh, major spawning spots, but uh, this year there's no crabs there at all. Wherever there are ant colonies on the terraces above the shore, few crabs have made it through to the coast. Oh, you're starting to get crabs again now. Oh, yeah, it's quite, quite reasonable numbers there on that overhang. But the bright splashes of red are few and far between. The ants have taken a heavy toll. Wherever they claim territory, they annihilate all other living things. A young emerald dove fallen from its nest is doused with burning acid around its eyes and beak. It has no defense and will soon be dead. Crazy ants are so named because of their frenetic behavior. They originated in Africa and have been accidentally spread throughout the tropics by human activity. They need a constant supply of protein to produce eggs and larvae. Nothing survives these coldly efficient workers. They seize every opportunity to kill and consume the creatures of this forest. The last of the crabs have finally arrived. For some, it's been a long trek that's taken many days. Here, they can at least rest for a time and dip in the replenishing waters. But even here, they aren't safe. In the waters around Christmas Island, there are over 30 species of moray eel.
When it seizes a crab, the eel ties itself in a knot, pulls the crab through its coils, crushing and peeling off its shell all in one fluid movement. A few days later, the beach is completely deserted. All around the island, the crabs have suddenly disappeared. Another mysterious signal, known only to the red crabs, sends them moving back toward the forest. As they climb the limestone cliffs, some pass the nests of red-tailed tropic birds where they must pay a heavy penalty for the crime of trespass. But this is just a short journey. Their destination is the shore terraces above the cliffs that will soon be their mating grounds. Here, they begin to prepare breeding burrows. The male's claws, which so delicately spoon water, now move piles of dirt as they dig the burrows that will attract females. But as prime digging space gets scarcer, competition increases. Fights are more bluff and bravado than brute force. It's rare that males are seriously injured and lost limbs usually grow back during the following year's molt. Highly prized burrows are shallow and only about a foot long, but without one, a male crab is unlikely to find a mate. These crabs usually avoid the heat of the sun, but the time of migration is an unusual time, and their behavior is driven more by hormones than the need for comfort. Beneath the drying rays of the sun, some take refuge in their newly dug burrows, pulling leaves across the entrance to maintain humidity and prevent dehydration. Rising winds herald the return of the monsoon. As the winds increase, young boobies and frigate birds fly the updrafts above the cliffs before the rains take hold. But there is another seabird on the island whose young cannot yet fly the windy cliffs. The monsoon rains sweep up and over the limestone ramparts, drenching the rainforest. In a nest high in the canopy sits an abbot's booby chick. Though six months old and fully feathered, it does not yet fly. It waits for its parents to bring food from far off feeding grounds. The rain softens the soil and revives the land. It also revives the digging and fighting. As the tempo of fighting increases, the females begin to move among the breeding burrows. Mating season has finally begun. 
Though red crabs usually mate underground, in these cooler, damper conditions, some are seen in the open. Like everything else about crabs, the act of mating is extremely slow. A coupling embrace can last up to 25 minutes, after which the female moves underground to fertilize and incubate her eggs. The males, however, immediately begin the long journey back to the forest plateau. Recent rains and cloudy days means their return march is a lot easier. They retrace their steps up the same valleys and across the same piece of road that brought them down to the shore. But on the return journey, some crabs find that their path is not as clear as it was a few weeks ago. New crazy ant territories now block their homecoming path and the killing begins all over again. A day later, these killing fields have turned into a morbid feast to which blowflies are attracted. Within hours, the blowflies' eggs have hatched into voracious maggots. But the ants do not tolerate these intruders. Even the maggots and their wallows of decaying crab flesh are attacked and sprayed with lethal acid. They will soon become more food for the masses of larvae in their colonies. But yellow crazy ants are not just mindless killers. They're also shrewd and skillful livestock farmers. Crazy ants farm scale insects. These red and yellow bulbs are adult scale insects that attach themselves to the surface of the trees. Once attached, they suck sap and excrete energy-rich sweet honeydew, which the ants harvest and feed on. Wherever in the world these ants are found, their livestock is always close by. These two creatures have developed a close relationship. The ants take the scale to new pastures, and the scale rewards the ants with honeydew. These are a different species of scale insect, but they're farmed in the same way. But the ants have another strategy to increase both honeydew production and their own population. They move young scale insects high into the branches. This helps increase the range of both scale insects and ants. Having an abundant food supply up in the trees means the invaders can spread there too. When the abdomens of the worker ants are full, they pass the honeydew they have harvested to other workers. Scientists hope that if they can find a poison the ants will accept, it will eventually be spread in this manner. Honeydew that isn't gathered can cause serious problems when it falls onto the leaves below. It creates a sooty mold that covers the leaves, stopping them from harvesting energy from the sun which can cause parts of the trees to die. If the ants continue to spread the scale insects, the sooty mold will also spread and could kill large areas within the high branches of the rainforest. 
Increased canopy dieback would have a devastating effect on the creatures that live there, especially Abbot's booby. Abbot's booby was once widespread on islands of the Indian Ocean. Christmas Island is now the only place left in the world where they still nest and breed. Even here, one quarter of the birds' nesting sites have already been destroyed by human activity. During the 1970s, part of the rainforest was clear felled to allow the mining of phosphate. The phosphate rock is mined and then ground to dust to be exported as fertilizer. Although clear felling has now stopped on Christmas Island, the legacy of the past is still hazardous for the Abbott's booby population. The cleared areas expose the nesting sites to huge wind gusts. It means the birds can sometimes have trouble landing in the trees and may fall. If an Abbott's booby falls to the ground, it cannot lift itself up from the forest floor, so the bird will die, either from starvation or attack by ants. The chick's parents have returned. Abbott's boobies are unique in that a chick spends an astounding 13 months in and around the nest. At a time when most of the island's young seabirds are feeding themselves, the monsoons and a shift in coastal fish populations prevent the chick from foraging at sea. So young birds remain dependent upon their parents for food. Because of the long time spent raising a single chick, Abbott's boobies only breed at best every three years, and on average produce one independent offspring every five years. If the ant explosion is not slowed or stopped, this unique bird may be lost from the world forever. Two weeks have now passed since the crabs mated. From their burrows on the forest floor, the females, heavy with fertilized eggs, are on the move. Within each brood pouch are up to 100,000 eggs and within each egg beats the heart of a tiny crab. The females slowly make their way from the coastal terraces down to the shoreline, carrying the hopes of all red crabs with them. As they travel, their movements are made more cumbersome by their precious loads. They move with purpose and resolve. They have an appointment with the moon. Their eggs will only be released to the ocean at a particular confluence of moon and tide. Within the undergrowth, a predator waits. A robber crab is on the hunt. It easily overcomes its prey and helps itself to a protein-rich dinner made more nourishing with lashings of caviar.
All around Christmas Island, the red heart beats to the same rhythm as the females move to the sea. The heart does not beat as strongly as in the past because of crazy ants. But the survivors are about to play their part in determining the island's future. Most females make it to the safety of the shore, where they dip, washing the mud of the burrows off their shells. But their eggs are not released. It is not yet time. From Greta Beach to the blowholes and all around the island, the females continue to arrive. But there are extensive areas where the cliffs are not splashed with red. More evidence of the huge devastation being caused by the ants. Even though the ants have been on the island for 50 years, they've only recently begun to impact heavily on crab numbers. How much longer can the crab sustain such heavy losses? This year, there are far fewer females coming to spawn than ever before. As recently as two years ago, the gathering females looked like this. Practically the entire coast was painted red with life. Max has been monitoring the migrations for years. This is one of the smallest gatherings he's ever seen and he's most concerned for the crab's survival. There's never been a time when the female's role was more critical. And tonight is the time when they must play their part. As the day lengthens, the female crabs wait. Tonight is the night of the neat tide, the smallest difference between high and low. The last quarter of a waning moon rises. Its light is the signal the females have been waiting for. As each female reaches the water, it's as if she's raising her limbs in an ecstatic dance of life as she offers her eggs to the ocean. Soon the sea is saturated with spawn, countless millions of tiny lives whose battle for survival begins from the moment they leave their mother's protection. As soon as the eggs are released, they hatch, and masses of larvae or megalopae swarm the shallows. The crab larvae are like miniature mythical beasts with tiny spikes on their heads, which they use to rip open their egg sacs. And their powerful tails propel them into the next stage of life. The crab larvae will go through several life stages before they come back to the land. During that time, they will be at the mercy of fish, 
ocean currents, and the weather. Only when the survivors return to land in three or four weeks will the success of the spawning be known. Their eggs released, the female crabs begin to move out of the water and across the beach. The sun rises upon females with their brood pouches now empty, beginning the long march back to the forest plateau. Among them are a few females who haven't released their eggs. They will spawn over the next few nights. Some of the crabs dip in the ocean one last time before returning to the forest for another year. The purpose of their journey fulfilled, the females move more easily now. It's been a month since they began their migration. This is their journey home. Like the males, they take the same route inland as they took down to the sea. And like the males, some find that conditions have changed since they came to spawn. Crazy ants have invaded the burrows on the lower slopes. As the red crabs seek safety, they are overcome. It's the same story all over again. The ants attack. The acid blinds and chokes them, and they suffer a slow death. Though some crabs try to run, there's nowhere left to hide. Their island paradise is changing rapidly. This is the Christmas Island rainforest as it's been for many thousands of years. And this is what it's rapidly becoming. Where the ants have taken over, the forest is choked with weeds and seedlings. It's not difficult to see the parts of the forest where the crabs have been wiped out. These areas of thick undergrowth are expanding, like the ant colonies. As part of their strategy, scientists are monitoring the impact the ants are having on the forest itself. The more information they have, the better their chance of beating the ants. They're measuring the rate of change in the forest within heavily infested areas. It's a chilling exercise. For even if the ants are controlled and red crabs are able to repopulate these areas, they believe it would take many decades for the forest to return to its natural state. But controlling the ants, or even halting their spread, is the most pressing task. The key to stopping their spread will be in understanding their behavior and most importantly, working out exactly how workers cooperate by passing on information and food to other members of the colony. Scientists' main hope is that the cooperative behavior of crazy ants can be turned against them that they will pass poison from ant to ant and that way spread death throughout their colonies. There are several highly effective ant poisons in use around the world but finding the right bait 
where a tractant for the conditions on Christmas Island would prove a lot more difficult. As the ants forage for food, they pass through sites where poison has been laid. This green poison has a fish oil attractant, but the crazy ants ignore it. Trials with a second yellow poison, which has a carbohydrate attractant, reveals fascinating behavior. A tiny fodolian picks up the bait and is attacked. But the poison is ignored. Then a second Fidoli tries, in vain for the bait. Finally, a third group claims the poison. Again, the crazy ants attack. This time though, as the scientists had hoped, a crazy ant picks up the poison and carries it towards the nest. But it carries it right past the nest, all the way to the colony midden, or rubbish dump, and disposes of it. As the storm of the ant invasion builds on land, the weather deteriorates out at sea. This is no longer the refreshing caress of the monsoon. Christmas Island has caught the edge of a full-blown tropical cyclone. It's now been three weeks since the spawning. The first of the crab larvae were due to return from the ocean about now. Their chances of survival don't look good. Finally, the storm recedes, its damage done. This Abbott's booby chick is very lucky to be alive. It was swept from its nest in the gale force winds and was brought to Max before the ants or starvation could take their toll. He will care for it for at least six months until it is ready to take wing and roam the vast oceans far from Christmas Island. Exactly one lunar month after the main spawning, a second, smaller event takes place. There are fewer females this time, but they perform the same ritual, the same dance of life. The red crabs have one more chance at sustaining their numbers this year. The specialized legs or pleopods that held the egg safe for so long now push them out, releasing them to their fate. One crab's misadventure is another's hearty meal. At this time of year, the water should be red with returning larvae, 
but the storm and the hordes of waiting fish have taken their toll. None of the larvae from the first spawning have returned. Although the second spawning offers another small chance, the crab larvae will still have to face the same dangers at sea. On average, only one year in five yields a successful mass return of young crabs. This will not be a good year. Finally, a few from the second spawning return. Like tiny spiders, this next generation crawls inland, retracing a journey their species has made for thousands of years. Instinct pulls them forward. But in spite of all they've already endured, nothing in their biological inheritance has prepared them for what lies ahead. Crazy ants. This is an island in crisis. Scientists already know that exterminating the ants will be almost impossible. And the very best they can hope for is a partial victory. For the island's crabs, that means partial defeat. It's unlikely that we will ever see red crabs in the numbers of years now past. The very heartbeat of Christmas Island is fading and there will be no easy solution.